Okay, so uh, the first presentation is coming from Kandan. I'll be short and just give the floor to her, please. Thank you. You do what? <laughs> so Kandan, please start. Okay, uh, hi, welcome. Uh, I am Jan Daniel Kisedar. I'm a PhD student at Politecnico di Milano. And my submission is about uh, EO-based retrospect retrospective time series analysis. Uh, I got support from CS Romania uh, by Lawrence U. Nicola uh, on this project. So what is this about? Um, I'm sure you are all familiar that EO and EO-based data are typically big in volume and uh, available for multiple times. And these spatiotemporal datasets are hard to find. Uh, they don't need to be downloaded, stored on your hard drive, and software for um, visualization and analysis purposes needs to be installed on your computer, which all requires JS expertise. So keeping these in mind, I developed a WebJS uh, that enables to visualize and, anal and analyze the spatiotemporal EO-based data on web using free and open source software to eliminate this need for expert knowledge. It also allows to get anyone insights related to human activities on Earth and climate change. I used four different data sets, uh, which are uh, restricted to Italy because of the limited hardware that I had. Um, these are Globland 30 for two different years, 2000 and 2010, with 30 meter resolution. Land cover map of ISPRA uh, with 10 meter resolution, uh, for only one year, uh, global human settlement layer for four different years with 40 meter resolution, and build up area map from ISPRA again for uh, four different uh, years with 10 meter resolution. Um, Geovisualization is um, a transformed cartography and it allows three and four dimensional data representation. We all know that virtual globes for visualization is a new frontier. For this purpose, for this reason, uh, I used CSM.js for creating the virtual globe. And uh, I have more or less three um, different approaches that I followed for the um, visualization and analysis of the uh, spatial temporal data sets. Uh, one is visualization, and for that I used uh, animation. Um, uh, to detect the land cover and soil consumption changes visually. Uh, I used OGC standard WMTS uh, and uh, image mosaic through GeoServer. Also the timeline and animation widgets of CSM.js for this. This is how it works. You can see the global human settlement layer here for Rome and um, it shows how the uh, how the uh, human settlement changed from 1975 to 2010. And this visualization is on a virtual globe, so you also have the terrain. Uh, for the analysis part, I use Razdaman and uh, specifically uh, their um, OGC standard um, WCPS, Web Coverage Processing Service, and uh, the DataCube technology. As you know, Razdaman contributed a lot for developing this standard, and one person from Razdaman is here. Uh, it allows to uh, have uh, multiple operations. Um, I won't go into the details. They are. Uh, subsetting, range subsetting, induced operations, condensers, and coverage constructors. Um, I am using uh, firstly trimming and condensing. Um, I allow using virtual globe, uh, a user to select two different years, draw an area on the virtual globe, and um, select for which to calculate the change. Uh, for, for, uh, uh, for which uh, pixels actually. So I, I will just uh, show you the screenshots. screenshot. Uh, in the screenshot, um, the, the user selects it, selected two years, 2000 and 2010, and then uh, stated that they want to calculate the change for permanent snow and ice and drew an area. Uh, the Razdaman allows you to calculate um, the Num the amount of change for this land cover class for these two different years and the drone area. This is the query only for single year and then I do the same um, operation for another year and then basically calculate the difference. This is, pretty this is pretty fast. This is the whole Lombardy region of Italy and it takes only a couple of seconds. 
Uh, this screenshot sadly shows that uh, from 2000 to 2010, permanent snow and ice cover decreased around 60%, according to the Global and 30 data set. I also um, use slicing, so the user can click on a pixel, uh, which is a coordinate actually, and gets the change amount of change uh, for that pixel for all the years that is available in that data set. Uh, for instance, in the first one, for the ISPRA build-up area map, for that coordinate, you can see how, uh, it, uh, how the um, build-up change for that coordinates, coordinate. And uh, in the second one, you can see uh, the area which was a cultivated land once became artificial surface. <laughs> um, again, using uh, the um, WCPS. Uh, lastly, I also uh, overlay VGI data, volunteer geographic information, on the on the raster maps. Uh, this is uh, related to Global and Turkey again, and uh, users can query each point to get um, the collected information by the users and uh, make a quick uh, visual inspection whether. Uh, Global and 30, the official data set is correct or not, and th this can be a preliminary step for the validation. <coughs> the data is collected using the land cover collector application that I, that I developed, which also can be found on my GitHub. And uh, this project, uh, final words, this project has been developed in uh, Urban Jubic Data Project. And the source code of this WebJS is available online on my GitHub. And also you can find it online following this link. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kandana. <laughs> You've been quite in time. Huh? <laughs> and um, because, uh, as I said at the beginning, it's a special session with uh, not so length presentation, with not with the same length uh, as the others. I will take only one quick question, if there is one for Kandan. If not, I'll ask the, the next speaker to, to start his presentation. Volker, are you ready? Yeah, I just got the information with us where the uh, slides are. So, I'm quickly now, so just a sec. Okay. So, every, so everyone who submitted them would um, have them available. So, uh, Operetta. Yeah. There you go. So just, yeah. Make things easier. All right. Please, please use the mic. Yeah, I just need to start the. Yeah, also the timer. Oh, no problem. I will share that. Yeah. Um, where's the mic? Yeah, it's behind the door. Yeah. When people should also sign the thing. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, where's full screen? You full screen mode. <laughs> All right, uh, I try to keep it quick so we save some time. So that's the title, everyone can read. All right, so the intro is, so as the title is quite complex, uh, STAC stands for Spatial, Spatial Temporal Asset Catalogs. To keep it short, it's a simple metadata catalog optimized for discovery and search. Then I talk about the decentralized web. That's a complex topic, but in my case, here it means it's a decentralized content address system. And the project that I actually did for this challenge was, so I came up with it myself. The project was making the stack browser, so a web UI to browse those catalogs, and work on a content address system. The idea behind it was, as stack is an, standard, an upcoming standard, I wanted to make sure that it works on content address systems because I think that's the future and I don't want to have an upcoming standard that is not prepared for the future. Um, I won't spoil if it's, if it's ready for the future or not. We'll see at the end. So quick about content address systems because many of you probably don't know um, the details about it. It's about which data it is and not where the data is. So location addressing is like, where the data is stored. Think about the World Wide Web. This is kind of the typical example for a location address system. And the problem is if you have a link somewhere, it might be gone, it might be some other contents. Um, you all know it from browsing the web. And with content addressable, you identify 
the data with an identifier, and it doesn't matter if it's on your local machine, if it's on the web, if it's somewhere else. It's kind of like an ISBN number for a book, so it really describes the contents and not the location where it is. Um, the nice properties are it is a hash. Um, you can just automatically, so you get the data with an identifier, and then once you have the data, you can run certain computation on it, and then get again the identifier back, and if it's the same thing, you know it's actually, actually the same data. Also, in the content address space, data is immutable. This means you know that the data hasn't changed because it has the same identifier, it's the same data. And you kind of get implicit versioning. As I don't have that much time, I just skip over it. And I want to give you an example to make it uh, a bit clearer, perhaps. So stack uh, is um, anchored in JSON, as you can see here. But what we really care about is the links. How to, this is basically how you build up the catalog. And those links look like this. So they have a relation and they have an href, which is an URL. And the nice thing is splitting those two things apart because what often happens, links are just really URLs. But then you encode within the location what it is. So, for example, if you have slash item, you would encode in the location what data it is, and in stack, what they do is they encode the relationship in a separate field. Um, and that's uh, very powerful, because what you can do is, if I now want to make this content addressable instead of location addressable, I first need to throw away those, but that's details, I come to it later. You point to a child, and what you can just do it is you can replace it with a content addressable link, which looks like this, and you might wonder, that's not a URL. It is a valid URL. And that's pretty nice. So IPLD is the system that I've worked on, and this is just a hash. So now you, um, it doesn't matter if this is on your local directory, if it's on the web, it is, if it, or it's somewhere else. But you still know the relationship that is a child to your catalog. Um, if you do such a system, there are certain restrictions on the links. Um, so. For example, if you build such a hash of the data, such a link, you need to know the data, obviously, so in order to derive the identifier, which means that you can only link to children because if you want to look at the parent, you don't know what the parent is before you've looked at the child. Um, it's kind of hard to explain in 10 minutes, so if you have any questions afterwards, feel, feel free to see me. Um, so. The advantages that you have with embedding the links in your data is that it also becomes part of the data. Which means if a link to a child is changing, also the data itself is changing. Which means that changes kind of bubble up to the, to the root of the catalog. So if you have a, an identifier of the catalog, you know that you have exactly the data that someone else is seeing. And if you change anything within the catalog, you will get another identifier and can send out this link. So you can always make sure that people see exactly the same version. And you can also kind of like go back in time because if you just send the older identifier of the catalog, you would see the old version. So you kind of get consistency um, for free. And the technology that I've used for, uh, for this stuff was um, the interplanetary link data, IPLD, this is actually what I work on on my day job. And it's open source, it has open specifications, it is an open implementation in JavaScript, in Go, and soon in Rust. Um, I've used the existing stack browser um, and really only did minor modification. It was like 10 uh, lines of code changed and it just worked. And um, to process, I used existing catalogs and just processed them with a small script to make sure those links are then actually content addressable links. And but if you want to know more, like I've, those are the links. So about like all the stuff that I've been talking about. And there's also um, if you want to know more about all this content addressable thing, I gave a talk yesterday, which was called GeoData on IPFS, which was recorded. So. Feel free to watch the, those or catch me. I'm here at, um, for the full conference. Yeah. Um, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Volker. <laughs> Again, we are in time. Uh,
I would have 1,000 questions for that, but <laughs> I, I don't have the time. Uh, so I can take one quick question for Volker. If you want to raise it now. Yes, Alessandro, please. Are you in touch with the people which are working on the standard on the OGC? Yes, uh, so I'm not like I'm not if they are OGC people, but I'm in, in touch with the with the creators of the stack standard. So I've also attended the biweekly meeting and so on, and I and know them well for the past ten years. So yeah, I'm in touch with them. Yeah, that was one of my questions too. Yeah. But it's uh, <laughs> good that the answer is positive. So with that, I would pass the floor to Ivan. I know what each of them is presenting, but uh, I'll let you be surprised by Ivan as well. <laughs> okay. Ivan, please. Yes, so hi everybody, I'm Ivan, and I'm going to talk about WebGL2 and 32 bit GeoTIFFs. Uh, this is not new, I have been doing uh, leaflet Tyler GL since something like 2016, but it was able to process 8 bit rasters. This is a uh, kind of all technology in which uh, you can load 8-bit images on any web browser because all the images that we usually see on websites are 8-bit per channel, or GBA. And that's the problem with technology. Right now we can only do that uh, and we can only load JPG and PNG. This is not new. I want to emphasize this is not new. This has three years of history by Maps and Stangram that we're doing this with uh, with a lot of workarounds. So instead of instead of having a float 32 texture or any, something like that, they would pack a 32 bit integer in the four channels of an RGBA image. And for us computer people, that's kind of understandable. For JS people, that is madness, I think. So um, on the other hand, we have this technology called WebGL2, which is uh, the same as OpenGL. 3ES, which is based on OpenGL something. It's a whole mess of things, but uh, it can handle more kind of textures, namely 32-bit uh, floating point, and also in some uh, constrained instances, 16-bit uh, integer, and so on. The problem, and the main problem, is that only 54% of browsers, as of today, can handle this technology. And I had to, I was very scared when it didn't work in one of the browsers in this laptop, which is not mine, but in happy kind of words. Uh, it's not that situation is not going to improve because of Safari and Apple has some political stances on the technology stacks, but it kind of works. So what I was asking myself when the Earth Observation Channel, uh, the Earth Observation Challenge was launched, is can we GL2 load 16 or 32 bit per sample cloud optimized geotiffs and do raster processing on them? And I'm proud to say yes, it can. <laughs> So it's demo time. I have the demos here. Uh, if anybody can uh, wants to try this at home on, their, on your laptops, be aware it will work on 54% of the cases, but you are most welcome to try. So I will just show quickly that I can do. This is a 32-bit um, floating point, 8 megabyte uh, digital elevation model from the uh, Spanish uh, Geographical Institute, and I'm doing the hill shading in real time. Because I'm doing it in the client, I can raise the sea level like this. Ooh. <laughs> and I'm not requesting any server for any more images. By the way, this web page is running off a Raspberry Pi, which costs like $30. I don't need AWS cloud services. I don't need any kind of big raster processing machine ever. And it's like, ooh. <laughs> okay. And then I have this other um, demonstration. This is uh, using uh, Sentinel-2 cloudless um, infrared and red bands provided by EOX, one of the uh, challenge partners. And what I'm doing here is NVDVI on the browser in real time. And these geotiffs run on, they weight around 100 megabytes each. Because they are load optimized, I can load them even though my Raspberry Pi is on a residential DSL connection. So no big data centers here, okay? And of course, because I'm doing this in the browser, I can tweak the parameters of the NDVI. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> like, ooh, 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 right? And uh, anybody here has epilepsy problems? I hope not. If you have, 
Please look away now. I can do, I can do NDVI 30 times per second in the browser. I do not need any big raster processing. The GPU on any of your laptops is powerful enough to do any kind of raster processing on full detail, on full um, precision, GeoTIFF data, several times per second. I'm not saying that you have to rewrite your stacks to do this. I, th I want to say, and I wanted to make a technology demo to say, this is something that we should take into account. This will allow me, or anybody, any geographer, to try new raster geoprocesses way faster. I don't have to wait three minutes for the process to finish before I took a parameter and run it again. This can help us, and we should have this on mind when designing the technology. And uh, I tried to make a, bit, a few more demos. I didn't really have the time. I, the code is on some Git repository there. Uh, there are some problems there. Um, I have to get the Integra 16 textures on to float 32 uh, fields because stuff. Um, uh, we could do things like packing the textures as 8-bit and just passing them and try to make it more transparent. Um, resampling on, on GeoTIFF.js takes the CPU and that's low-hanging low fruit. Uh, this is something that we should work with. You know, WebGL is also very good at sampling, uh, sampling and no sampling. It's like scaling up and down and making all the, all the pixels match and make nearest neighbor or interpolating pixel values. And that's it, really. That's all I had. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ivan. <laughs> Any questions for Ivan? Uh, I'll take one. Please. Lawrence. Uh, two quick, quick questions. One is uh, whether you can see the pixel values. Like we, if you move the mouse over one pixel, can you see the NDVI value from there? And the other one is uh, whether you've looked into tone, pep tone mapping the 32-bit the or 16-bit uh, samples because they can look dark or washed out otherwise, like, like in that. Right now, I do not think you can see the, raw pic the output pixel values because you have to map that to actual color. So you have to do this workaround of outputting the color then querying the color and converting that color to a numerical value that you can read. That's something that has to be done. Right now, as far as I'm aware, you cannot, uh, you cannot output a float32 texture and read those values. Also, WebGL and all kind of GPU processing only use 24-bit precision for the internal calculations. So if your geoprocess really uses a lot of precision, you might have some losses there. I don't think that's the case, because as far as I'm aware, Earth Observation only cares about 12. But you have to tweak your things around, really, and, and packing things is, is a problem. I would love to see this kind of difference between the technical part of the geoprocessing and the actual geosciences part of the process. There's, there's a lot of friction there, I feel. And I think we should work to ease that friction. Not, uh, w when you're designing a system for raster processing, it's not only about how much data can you take, how, uh, uh, what's the end result, how fast can you do the calculations. It's also about how easy it is for the geographical sciences people to develop new algorithms and try new algorithms. The, you have to tell apart the ease of use of development, technical development, or geosciences development. There's a lot of things one can focus, and I think that designing raster algorithms should be faster and, has le and, and having less friction with the technical part. That's what I was trying to use. Okay, uh, with this I thank again Ivan, and uh, I'll invite uh, to take the floor uh, Vasil Jordano. Yeah, I will ask. Uh, we are ahead of time, so basically people coming in and expecting a talk, but it's already gone. So basically the next talk should be at 11.40 and not now. Oh. So we are like 10 minutes before schedule. Yeah, okay. So the problem is people coming in and see the talk always gone. Okay, I'm sorry for that, but... Uh, yeah, just so you yeah. don't want to make a 10 minute break or something. Oh. So just,
choose this one? Yeah, I've... Just a second, please. Okay. Uh, yeah, apparently we're a bit uh, uh, ahead of schedule and uh, people who is looking for a presentation is a bit uh, puzzled. Uh, but... Uh, uh, well, I'm just waiting for the door to close. Or, uh, I don't know. And at the end, I will ask all the speakers to sign the agreement uh, that is on the at the speaker desk there. Okay, um, please have your s place somewhere. And uh, Vasil, please have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Vasil, uh, coming from Politecnico de Milano, and I want to present you our submission. Uh, along with our team, including Eduardo Pezina and Vladislav Ivanov. Uh, the submission is called Application uh, Earth Observation from Landslides. But before presenting you the application itself, I should uh, introduce you to the problem that we are trying to solve here. When we are talking about hazard management, and especially landslide hazard, a really important key source information is the landslide inventory. It contains all the information, not all, uh, it contains information for past events, including the location and additional information interesting for all the researchers and the academia. The problem is that uh, the landslide inventory should be always continuously updated. The old inventories can be incomplete and can uh, be hard to interpret in different manners. And when we want to implement automatic, automatic landslide detection systems using machine learning and uh, earth observed data, we need a reliable training set. Here is an example with uh, the Italian landslide inventory in the uh, valley north in northern Italy, where in interpreting, interpreting it, it can arise a lot of questions and it can be problematic. In the meantime, Earth observation can uh, change drastically with the new technologies. But it's not just the technologies that are, should be de developed, also the management of the data, because we received uh, big amounts of data each day. And this is also relevant for the geosciences, which actually uh, hold hand by hand with the Earth observation for the hazard management. So our solution, our answer, for the challenge is to integrate all the those three disciplines, earth observation, geoscience, and crowdsourcing. While the earth observation and the automatic models can produce a reliable landslide inventory, in situ measurements can uh, polish and give additional information and additional interpretation of the data, while the crowdsource crowdsourcing and any volunteering w will be in benefit for the all the or the database. <coughs> so in this manner, uh, as a part of our application, we created this landslide survey mobile application where a user can uh, go on site and, um, and tag a landslide on the field. It depend, it, he can, a user can uh, choose a simple mode or expert mode depending on the level of the geological knowledge. While he will be guided with uh, different questions through the process of registering a new landslide. In addition, the, since the most of the landslides are occurring in the mountain area, the application can work offline since internet connection can be absent. <coughs> the idea is that the massive use of the application could generate a big amount of database that can be used for uh, further 
machine learning training validation sets using Earth observation data. The mobile application can be found on dedicated page uh, at GitHub. The client itself is uh, written in uh, Java, HTML, and uh, CSS, uh, wrapped with Apache uh, Cordova. While the server is in JavaScript, not an expert, and the database is uh, document oriented MongoDB. And here are some screenshots from the application. You can see the login screen, you, or you have to register first. Then uh, the query for the inserting a new landslide. A uh, user can review the entries, and then the entries can be reviewed on the OpenStreet basis. As I said, the application is just part of the whole application. Uh, and once uh, a new entry of the landslide is uh, stored on the application, the mobile application, uh, background service processing will start. <coughs> where firstly, a comparison with an existing inventory will be made, inventory and already existing database, to see whether the new entry is existing or not. After that, uh, additional advanced uh, machine learning techniques with uh, for automatic change detection will be implemented using a fusion between uh, optical and radar satellite images. And uh, here we're planning to use as a Sentinel-1 and 2 because for the scope of our work, the resolution and the time resolution are uh, quite good for that. In addition, artificial models will be artificial intelligence models will be implemented for the uh, automatic landslide characterization. And on the next step, it will pass also uh, accuracy assessment, and uh, mm, it will be uh, performed another comparison between the mobile application entry and the Earth observation output to see what is the level of, co of coherence between them. On the next step, the, uh, the entry will be uh, updated to the database with all the gathered information and it will be included a score. It will be assigned a score according to a scoring list. So once a user of the database will understand what is the level of the reliability of the entry. And finally, uh, the user will be asked whether he wants to produce a susceptibility map for the area of interest where he can incorporate uh, Earth observation data or uh, ground-based, also predefined and user uploaded. Here is just an example of, um, to, uh, of a landslide that occurred last year in northern Italy. The false RGB, all the images are derived from Sentinel-2. The false uh, imagery is just, uh, false RGB is just for a uh, visualization purpose of the landslide. On the left are the pre-event uh, uh, images, while on the right are post-event, and you can see clearly the landslide scar that has left. Also looking at the vegetation index, uh, the values have changed from average on from 0 0.8 to 0. <coughs> looking more in details on uh, those two pictures, one can notice that uh, values in the NDVI changed not only in the uh, landslide area, but also in different parts. This could be to shadows or clouds. So this is just highlighting that um, the, this the methodology and the technology is not sufficient by itself and uh, mm, better thresholds should be defined as well other techniques should be implemented. We have defined uh, five uh, target groups that we are planning to approach uh, during conferences and uh, academic journals as dedicated uh, presentations and courses will be also held. Our practice showed that uh, collaborations between uh, academia and local authorities in affected areas is highly appreciated and it's working quite well. So to just uh, show the timeline how we're going, we divided the application in three main phases. The mobile landslide survey app, the landslide uh, satellite landslide detection, susceptibility mapping. Up to now we have the mobile application completely working, constantly improving, while the other two phases are still currently under development. So up to now, we have a uh, landslide survey app, app that can be used by professionals and non-professionals. The output can generate uh, quite useful data, large amounts, and it can be in benefit for uh, 
local authorities and academia. We would like to, take, uh, to thank to our mentors from Polytechnico and uh, Deimos for the support and help through this processing. Thank you for the information. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Vasil. Thank you very much. We are in good time. Uh, so we have time for questions. I'm looking in the room. Yes, please, Alessandro. Um, a quick one. Did you receive requirement from the end user in the implementation of the user interface in terms of uh, which are the type of input that they expect to be provided from the user interface? The from some community that has provided you some... Yeah, from, uh, because we, uh, we have a geologist in the team, so basically we put a geological field paper as a questionnaire in the app. So this is the difference between the expert and uh, non-expert uh, uh, mode of the application. In non-expert, it's quite a simple few questions, while expert has a little bit more in details. and It has also questions and suggests answered. answers. Thank you. I think I can take one more question, if there is. Thomas, you need to wait for the mic. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a little one. Um, regarding the prediction of landslides, is there anything you can uh, tell us? I mean, this susceptibility uh, issue you mentioned already, but this is basically related to the existing landslides, and you predict probably the risk that there will be further ones, no? But uh, predicting landslides in areas which have not been yet affected, is this something you can also... Yeah, deal with? Uh, yeah, yeah, actually we can do this. That's why the inventory is quite important for this purpose because on the basis of the previous events we can study and uh, let's say predict the susceptibility to a certain level in areas that they were not affected till now. From okay. Uh, if there is no more questions. Okay. I thank again Vasil and I invite, uh, I think it's Bank Pam now. Seem to be the right one. <laughs> yeah, um, okay. Sorry, one more minute. I hold my hand. Should be working already. Hello? Hello? Okay, welcome everybody. Um, so today I will present my, pre my demo about using Comstat tree from the Korea to support for farming in Germany. My name is Bang Pham Hill and I'm working for Rathenman yeah, group. I mean team, yeah. So first I, I would like to thank for, for partner, of course, Rathenman who provide the raster database open source for 20 years, and also for the SIIS, which is the data challenge provider, which helped me to provide the com commercial da satellite images, which I can use for the third time. Also about Creodias for providing me the cloud demo. And also for NASA for providing me the loaded <coughs> um, 2D JavaScript land, which I can make the demo <coughs> nicely. Okay, so this is the data challenge from the ComSat. Basically, we have a lot of satellite data every day in terms of volume and velocity, but we need to somehow to process the data to we can gain the value in efficiently and quickly. And if we cannot do that, 
which means we can just store the data, a lot of data for nothing. So I would like to focus on the the main problem is in Germany is about for my target user is about the farmer. So the thing is we, we they have a lot of large fields and they cannot control every day like go to the field to check the, the crop health. And that's why we, they need to do something which is smart about the technology in agriculture. For example, here to use satellite images, at least for example from high resolution images like Constat tree to monitor the crop health, for example. And that is my proposed solution, which I need to build a WestGIS, which can take it for the user, German farmer, and also for the government, which they can monitor the crop from their home or their office. They don't have to go to the field to do something oh which God. is not even see. Okay, so, <coughs> so traditionally, traditionally one user we need to download the data to their PC, then have to process all the data, and it's very really limited to their system hardware. That's why we need to somehow to have a database, Raster database, which is Rasterman, somehow to start all the data as a 3D time series from all the satellite images we, we can collect every day, and, and by tiling the data to some smaller tile like this one, then which can enable user to query the data efficiently via, for example, on the left hand side, the OGC web coverage standard, allow user to select the area of interest and query all the data which they want for only the time slide, for example, a space from month to month or year to year. And to do that efficiently, Rustman, this is a unique uh, standard from Rustman, which is called web coverage processing service, allow this is extension from OGC WCF standard, which allow user to query directly to the data group, which is OGC WCF. For example, you can see here on the bottom is about <coughs> to can calculate, um, no, it's called calculate, to, to filter the data. We have some, something about the near infrared, which is greater than 127, for example. Um, so the workflow is first I, I get data from the Comsat and then I try to import it to Rustman. No, I know I try it. I can do it easily, of course. And then I try to, Im because I'm not Im <laughs> a satellite anal analyst, so I have to try to how to make some nice demo from them with only three band data with very high resolution. Um, yeah, then the last one, after I had some idea about make, making a demo, I can create a web UI client to store the more. So that is the result we, I have done is only one in one week. We got to have much time to use, but yeah, I have a lot of work to do. And yeah, so this is the demo it has by on the web on green, you see it on the globe on the right hand side. On the left hand side we have some demo about OVC WC and OCPS. And yeah, so basically this is about some demo you can you can see later. And for the thing is you can still can accept it live demo on this, the third URL, which is by on Creo, <laughs> yes, yeah. Hopefully you can, you can buy on this next month. Okay, and now I, I switch back to the, de the real demo. Um, so on the top side, um, so you can see that we on the ground we have a WMS concept tree layer which is based on 3D data proof which you can slide over the time series. For example, here I, I select an, a, another time slide in, in another month. And because of the time is imported with the pyramids which is uh, allowed to query the, the collection in very, very quick time. For example, if you in Higher distance, if you query the lowest, lowest resolution collision, and when you when you higher, low, lower di distance, you can query the highest resolution. Yeah, it's by on WMS time map in 3D coverage. And on the left hand side here, you can see that I <coughs> make some WCF band combination over also time theory and yes, and that's if we have, have the phone, um, the phone color of the concept tree data. And yes, I tried to win another band combination. You can see that because it was meant to try to process data very quickly. 
because we, we it only focused on the subset which I chose on the left hand side. And here you can so see that's also about WCS trimming and subsetting on the coverage. Like here, I try to query on smaller selection. Yeah. And also, yeah, try another band combination <laughs> because there are only four bands, so that's not much to show here. Okay, so here another a little bit demo from the wet wings. So it's basically a, a 3D wet gland. So we can rotate, pan and round, pan around to see more detail in flight mode. It would be much nicer because if this is like a mountain, but here only the field, so you cannot see that elevation is actually right up or down. Um, yes. Next. Okay, that's. Um, you, I, I can also get the the band value by clicking on the the, the overlaid data. You can see on the left hand side the value when I click on the on the image, it can return the value. Now I try to demo some Dali speed query, which is more powerful than of course than old Dali speed. For example, here you can see that the the formula for the band combination for NDVI, which is a template. And then I click on the show result. I have this only one band, no color. And yes, so that's why you can see the only one band before the red band here. And now for the color, by on the value of this uh, NDVI. Yeah, you can see that. Uh, because that I don't need to depend on the value of this one band, I can create a random value for this one, and then I can create a color schema like this one. Okay, this one is the same demo as that we said before. Now I try to extend the query with more more streaming. <coughs> yep. So I select another dead by hand slicing. Yep. And I try to calculate another index which is leaf area index. And you can see that this is about the color scheme which I use in the data spec query. And the it written like in, I think, a few hundred milliseconds. All right, this, um, yep, so I, I try to create some demo query, data spec query on, the, on this one. And you can go to the website to play with this. Here, Rasmus also can try to downscale on the server and it can return quickly for the image, and so upscale if you want. And here, for example, you can try to, to clip the detrail by a polygon <coughs> on, on the raster directly. It's a little bit slower. So you can see that on the top, it's, it's clipped by the polygon. And yeah, so I have this, my last demo, which is calculate NDVI over a year. So it's about over time theory. Uh, so on time slide over this year. And that is for my demo. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Bang Tham. <laughs> yeah, questions for uh, for him? Yes, go in. Uh, have you used Rasdaman with NetCDF files? Yeah, we support Ras uh, NetCDF file. Okay, and yeah. it's working well. Or have you had yeah. issues? Or not? Uh, yeah, it has been demoed for like you can check about us server two projects. We we have partner with ACMWF. They also use NetCF uh, and Grify format, like for a few years, it's no problem. I think we can take one more question for Bang Pam if there is one. Yeah, Anka. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, are you thinking to maybe extend this to bring some features that can um, make this tool uh, give more actionable information to the farmers? Uh, this is, I think, um, the purpose is I made this demo f for like to to the four four G conference and that's all. But I mean, the code is public in GitHub, so anyone can. Try to fog it and to make extensible please, for being commercial. Please keep the mic. Yeah. yeah. Then they then they can download my code here and they can 
like try to extend more future. If they if they have time, they they be. Uh, I I think that is very nice from like some if someone try to continue with this project because I think I have another thing to do as well, so I cannot do it continue to do it anymore. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very thank much, Bang uh, with this, I go to the next team that will present. If you find your presentation there. Yeah, that is, seem to be there and ready. Working, yeah. Yeah, please use the mark. Okay, so hello everybody. I'm Malina, and together with Adrian and uh, another colleague who at the moment is at, uh, he's a volunteer. Uh, we've tried to do a forest change detection, or more exactly, a cover change uh, in Apusem Mountains from Romania. We are uh, rookies in the open source world, so please have mercy. <laughs> Actually, it's our first analysis in open source. Okay, so our motivation uh, came from this one. So, um, as you can see, this is a simple print screen from Google Earth in Apusen Mountains, and you can clearly, with an open eye, you can see the, the, the forest loss from 2003 and uh, 2017. Please, next slide. Yes. So this is a situation that should be international. <laughs> Okay, next. Okay, so what we have tried to do is to combine a bit the GIS semi-automated uh, methods with and an uh, open learning automated method. For the semi-automated method, uh, oh, this is the study area, it's the uh, western part of the Carpathian Mountains from uh, Romania, Apusen Mountains more exactly. Next, please. Um, the data source that we have used were Landsat 5TM and Landsat 8TM from the years 1992 and 2019. Uh, these dates were very, very important for us because uh, I don't know if you are aware with the Romanian history. Uh, in 1989, December, Romania. Uh, We, we exited communism. Exited communism. <laughs> and uh, democracy was taking the rightful place. But this also came with uh, some issues. Yeah, some issues. Uh, for vector layers, we used the Corinna cover as a ground truth. And the software that we finally uh, after many, many tries, uh, decided to use was Sagajis. So the conceptual scheme uh, for uh, this, uh, our unsupervised classification was quite simple. Import the data, clip the area, conduct the unsupervised classification, the K means clustering. Reclassify, which was quite easy because we just exported the uh, CSV table and then with a drag and drop uh, put it back into the saga gist, and then compare the classes uh, and create the confusion matrix. So as a result, 1992 versus 2019, we had five classes, the uh, forest, pastures, uh, <laughs> sorry, I have emotion. Um, the, the unclassified, which is mainly the um, um, no, it's not the detected. Is the zona commercial and houses and uh, roads and buildings, and this is the yeah you can see the classes, <laughs> and as you can see the the 
changes from 1992 to 2019. So, yeah. yeah. So, basically, my wife and her friend, they wanted to show how you can use a semi-automated method in doing proper classification, which is freely available for everyone. We're here for the open source part, so that was it. Um, and then I'll move to the automated method. This is something that I'll be talking about. I'm also a new beginner in the whole field of new uh, of deep learning, of machine learning. So I've said, let me see what we can find. With limited information, can I make it work? So I found someone's code on GitHub. I will not take credit for it. He has used uh, the unit model for deep learning, uh, pretty much Python 3.7. I spun up a AWS uh, server with an NVIDIA Tesla GPU with 64 gigabytes RAM. And then I used the training data included, which were 24 satellite images uh, with eight bands, Sentinel-2. And all of those 24 satellite images were uh, run through the training program. And this was the model used. This is the unit architecture. It looks quite fancy, but it's actually quite easy to implement it. And it's been throughout all the conference. Uh, it's very useful and very easy to use in any image classification and segmentation. These are a few different samples. So there were five channels that the, that the software was looking for. So roads, buildings, water, trees, and others. And this is the example of a successful run. So for us, the main importance was to classify trees. This is why we're also called tree fitting. And as a conclusion, basically right now we see that with a, everyone can buy a CPU or a GPU at very affordable prices. And ultimately you can run deep learning on your own machine. And with, through this presentation, we've shown that anyone with limited information, or at least with a bit of will, they can go online on GitHub. They can find all the sources that you need, and you can do image classification and segmentation through various methods. Thank you. My, my mic is back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, is there any questions for this one? No? Thank you. If not, uh, I thank you very much again. And I ask the next presenter to prepare. Um, in the meantime, I will, uh, I will tell you that uh, uh, after the the challenge call, we had a number of uh, of applications registered. Uh, just to know a little bit about the mechanism, if you didn't check it on the website, uh, then we uh, had a, a first check. Uh, we announced the uh, the ones who registered their applications. Uh, then there was a, a phase in which they've been matched with uh, with mentors. Uh, the development process started and then they were asked to send some results in the form of uh, presentations and source code. Uh, and um, uh, for the presentations, they uh, were also asked to send recorded presentations so the jury can better understand uh, what are the, the results. Uh, and in the end, uh, we got the results, uh, the jury made, uh, and we'll have a final evaluation today, and the winners will be announced in the awards ceremony that will start at 4 today, 4 p.m. With this, I pass the floor to Theodora. Theodora, please use the mic. No, I think it's on. Oh, hello. Should be already working. Uh, who is presenting, I think, is the last one for today. Yeah. Okay, please. 
Hello everyone, I am Theodora and today I'm going to present LEAFS, a tool designed to leverage the artificial intelligence for forest sustainability. So deforestation has been a hot topic in the past few years. In Romania only, it's okay here, okay, here, here, <laughs> I have to say here, okay, so and I say here. And smile, is mandatory. Yes, so in Romania only, uh, this is a map of the tree cover loss from 2001 to 2016. Over 300,000 of forest acres have been lost. However, this tree cover loss is both due to illegal deforestation activities and to legal forestation activities, meaning that we have to supply the society with the wood demanded products that they desire. So what is the answer to this? The answer is to have sustainability, to have a sustainable forest management of the forest. This sustainability actually means that we certify forest owners, even if the, we talk about private forest owners or governmental uh, authorities for um, their forest certification that they um, manage their own forest in a sustainable way that they are going to take care of the regeneration of the forest and both to the consumers and to the industry that they take their wood product from a certified uh, forest. So LEAFS is not the usual uh, forest change detection tools. LEAFS is actually intended to support this forest management in a sustainable way and to help the process of sustainability in the forest uh, area. Through LEAFS we want to allow users to, to easily monitor the data and to easily get statistics and we do this by using deep learning algorithms. So we are mainly based on the forest segmentation task. In order to do this we need to use data sets and deep learning models. Our data sets uh, we have used two data sets. One is a public available data set that has recently been released. It's called Sent12MS and it contains Sentinel2 data. And then uh, after pre-training our models with that data set, we have used our own composed data set from Sentinel2 data over the Romanian area. And we have used the Korean land cover ground truth classes for it. Next, using this, we have used convolutional deep learning models. We have provided our own implementation for WNET, HSN, and an optimized UNET version. And we have to use one uh, already available DenseNet version. So our results are shown there, uh, are composed by an assemble of these models. So we had the data, we took them to the deep learning models, we identified forest classes and forest patterns, and then we displayed the result and computed the statistics for it. Okay, so actually for the non-deep learning uh, people in the room, there is actually a video on how the a deep learning model actually learns how to identify forests. You can see that it starts from nothing and then uh, gradually it can uh, identify more and more areas of the forest. Now I want to show you a short demo of the app. I don't know if the link, let's see if the link works. Okay, so moving forward here. So here you can view our interface. So, oh, oh how do I do that? No? Oh. Exit. Okay. Exit. <coughs> and now I'm going to try to. Yes. I already have it here, so I'll open it from here. Yes. Now let's move forward. So, for example, this is, um, let me just get here. 
So this is our uh, main uh, proof of concept uh, application. So you can view the forest and you can also manage here your forest, meaning that we can provide the management for the full area of the forest or a user can define its own private forest area and view only what the area he's interested in. Then of course we have the layers. We can, at uh, the layers, you can see the true color image or you can see the actual prediction from our models. We also have available data for uh, some of the parts that from different years. So if you want to see how the forest actually changed uh, during the years. And uh, of course here, here is the, like uh, the whole view of the Romanian uh, forest. Here you can see how the prediction actually looks when it's displayed. And, the and then here, we can actually zoom in and compute some statistics from an area that you want to. So we click on draw, we get an area. We select some area there that we want to. And then we send it for computing. We wait for the statistics part. And then we have the statistic of the different canopy co coverages for that specific area. So now I'm going to get back to the, yes, it's working, presentation, okay. Hoping it will work again. No? Yes. <laughs> well, so how did we do that? First of all, uh, we did use some technology for our first data handling. We used Rastario, Payona, Shapri, and GeoPandas because our, our code is mainly based on uh, Python. Then, of course, our deep learning methods for that, we used the Keras framework for implementation. And then our web application uses open layers, Twitter Bootstrap, GeoServer, and, uh, and PostGIS. So who is actually this application intended for? So we mainly designed LEAFs to create a community around the forest sustainability uh, area. So we want to address to the authorities and to the private forest owners to make, to use LEAFs as a tool for better monitoring their own forest. Another problem that is currently happening, given if in Romania, they it's hard to distinguish between illegal and legal activities. If we had a mapping of the actual uh, forest area, the authorities and the forest owners would actually know. I mean, if there is a change in an area, they would know if it's allowed for uh, tree deforestation in that zone or not. Then we want to address to the industry part because we want to reduce the cost of forest certification. So for now, if you want to get a forest certification, you have to pay for the auditor to come. But there are studies saying that uh, some of the criteria to get a forest certification can be made from remote sensing data. And some of them can are uh, three canopy coverage, for example, and those can also be done, uh, as you can see, from our uh, interface. And in addition to this, it will also reduce the bias attached to, uh, to like when a human auditor comes to certify because we uh, compute some of the data uh, from our tool. And then we want to create a responsible consumer community by promoting the brands uh, that use uh, sustainable forest uh, sources. So in our future work, we have a few di direction. We got in contact, contact with PEFC Association and uh, we do want to integrate the certification uh, part, I mean part of the certification process by using deep learning applied on remote sensing data. Uh, then we want to like actively monitor even the illegal forest activities and actively send notification if this happens. We also want to create a mobile application uh, that would be like uh, intended for consumers to see uh, the, the, the to see the sustainable uh, forest uh, companies that that are near side him and to promote the the certified labels. 
And then, of course, we want to give back to the remote sensing deep learning community because the deep learning remote sensing community has two major problems. First, the poor lack of label data sets, and we plan to uh, continue the developing of our data set and to uh, release it. And then the lack of pre-trained model on multispectral data, meaning not only uh, red, green, blue channels. So for now, we have uh, four models trained on two data sets, which is the CentOS MS data set and our data set. And we do hope to, for them to be like uh, a, for a first start for the future research in, uh, in this field. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Theodora. <laughs> we still have time for questions. I'm looking at uh, Sandro. Question, Teodora. With respect to the accuracy that you can generate, can, do you have some number with respect to different models um, that you have trained? And yes, so for now, I mean, um, the results that we have now are only made with, um, with, a, with a small like, data set with only with Sentinel-2. The data set still has a lot of no data images, so we still have to cure it and prepare it for release. And we did no post-processing, so only from what we have now, we have uh, uh, like a 0 0.74 Jacquard score on the whole area. Against Corinne? Against Corinne. No, against Corinne, yes. Against the Corinne data set. Thanks. Okay. We can take one more, even more. If not, uh, I think uh, some of the speakers are still in the room. No. The previous speakers, uh, uh, yeah, please. Ah, you are here, but uh, and Bang Pam is also here. So if you still have questions for yeah, uh, uh, for the previous speakers, we still have time for that. Um, I will, um, <coughs> if not, I will finish the the session here, asking the the speakers to don't forget to to sign the video recording agreement. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, with this, uh, um, I thank you very much all the speakers again for that. Uh, the, as I said, the, the jury will have a final discussion today and the, uh, the winners will be announced in the uh, award ceremony that will start uh, at, uh, at four. Yeah? Okay, then uh, I thank you all. Uh, again for, for coming. These are some of the uh, uh, challenges, uh, challenge participants' presentations. Not all of them are here. Not all of them had the presentation today, uh, simply because they are not here. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, we'll have some, some winners and you'll know that uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much. Again, we stop here and I wish you a good lunch.